Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends uh, we are taking up another aspect of uh, theorizing peasantry uh, which is basically an important component of uh, rural society in india and uh, i think uh, when we try to speak about theorizing peasantry we have to see how peasantry can be viewed across the globe and the important thing is that when we try to speak about the peasantry in a worldwide framework we have to see that how and to what extent uh, the peasantry has been represented across the globe. As we all know that <coughs> the distribution of the peasantry is not homogeneous and uh, accordingly we try to see that uh, different uh, world have the different framework with regard to the understanding of peasantry. Uh, like in the third world we try to see that uh, there is a abundance of uh, peasantry. On the other hand, if you try to see the developed nations, uh, there we have the lesser peasantry. So, that way if you try to see the distribution of peasantry is not going to be homogeneous and uh, also we try to see that there is a inherent uh, differentiation uh, which occurs in the peasantry. So, virtually the two things happens, uh, one thing of course is across the space the peasantry is not homogeneous and uh, I think uh, these things we have tried to spoke about when we try to speak about the issue of the debates on peasantry and also we try to speak about another important aspect that how we can see the uh, economic reference of the peasantry especially we try to deal with the contribution of uh, Karl Marx and Daniel Thorner uh, who basically tries to speak about that how peasantry uh, has been seen with regard to an economic history. I think uh, uh, Daniel Thorner or for that sake uh, the contribution of Kotaski or maybe we try to speak about the contribution of uh, V. I. Lenin, all these people have significantly contributed towards the understanding of the economics of peasantry. And uh, <coughs> this particular segment uh, which is basically uh, se segment 8, so I think uh, in unit 8. Uh, we are going to speak about the moral economy of peasantry and moral economy of the peasantry as the title itself speaks uh, is something different from uh, what has been spoken in the past because as we are moving towards the end of this unit of theorizing peasantry, we are also moving towards uh, the capitalistic and the post capitalistic era. So, we try to see that moral economy of the peasantry can be seen as that phase uh, which basically represents the society uh, which is in the global or maybe we can say in the advanced capitalistic stage of development or sometimes we try to see that uh, it is to be seen in terms of the modern era. And that is how we try to see that modern economy of peasantry uh, that is unit 8 is basically dealing with uh, one of the famous work by James Way Scott. And uh, James A. Scott uh, whose contribution is uh, quite significant when we try to speak about the moral economy of peasantry, especially it speaks about the peasant art of resistance against the capitalism. Because when we try to speak about the economy, the economic concern of peasantry, we try to see that how they were in tune with the peasant, uh, were in tune with the capitalistic order. And here we are trying to see that uh, the moral economy of the peasantry which is representing the art of resistance uh, which is basically seen in the era of capitalistic and the post capitalistic order. So, I think uh, if you try to magnify the whole issue of moral economy of peasantry, we try to find out that James A. Scott in 1976 has done a marvelous work and the title is the moral economy of the peasant rebellion and subsistence in the southeast Asia. Uh, this is basically a work which has been published from Yale University Press 
uh, new heaven and that is how we try to see that this work has got its global prominence uh, because of its typicality in terms of uh, providing a very insightful understanding about how the peasantry has been seen. Uh, James C. Scott, uh, who is considered to be uh, one of the founder with regard to uh, devising the understanding of the moral economy of the peasant in 1976, it appeared at a time when the peasant studies have begun to occupy an important place in the social sciences. Uh, because we try to see that uh, even the discussion of uh, peasant studies have came in 1967 uh, or we can say in the late 1960s where we try to see that uh, the understanding of the peasantry in the academic forum has started emerging. So, uh, basically we try to see that uh, this present work of moral economy has also came into existence when we had abundance of peasant studies. Uh, the book basically focus on uh, Vietnam as well as its novel argument about the causes of the rural rebellion attracted the widespread attention and unleashed acribic debates about peasants rationality and the applicability of concept from new classical economics to the small holding agriculturalist. James C. Scott in his anthropological work on Southeast Asian rice farmers in the 1930s has employed the term to explore their fears, values and habits. By examining their indignation and rage, he tried to embrace their moral economy and unravel the normative root of peasant politics. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see it is not only the concern for uh, the economy alone, rather it also tries to give a new color towards the uh, peasant politics also that uh, how peasant can play an important role with regard to the state politics, especially uh, how they can overcome the uh, new market forces. I think this is how we try to see the importance of the work is going to be visible. Uh, James C. Scott's work uh, argues for its continuing relevance for understanding peasant movement of the late 20th and the early 21st century. Uh, one of the more uh, thorough effort to trace the origin and shifting boundaries of moral economy is E. P. Thompson's essay, The Moral Economy Reviewed that came in 1991, uh, which appeared 20 years after his famous work a uh, pioneering article on the English crowd that was in 1971 and 15 years after the James C. Scott's contribution of the moral economy of the peasant. Thompson locates the first mention of the moral economy in the late 18th and the early 19th century when the chartists and the other critics of capitalism juxtaposed it against the laissez sphere political economy espoused by the quacks. Moral economy was in general confined to confrontation in the marketplace over the access or entitlement to the necessities essential foods particularly profiting and the belief usage forms and the deep emotions that surrounds the marketing of food in the time of dearth. So, Scott's use of moral economy places somewhat less emphasis however, on consumers participation in food market than on the values or the mores. So, I think one thing is quite clear that uh, James C. Scott was speaking about uh, how we can see the concern of values or mores uh, which are been uh, of importance for peasantry and how that act as an important tool for uh, fighting against the so called market system, the modern market system. And it is not simply uh, they are uh, uh, being uh, peasantry being seen as an object with regard to the consumers participation in the food market, rather their values or mores how they are going to play an important role. Uh, most peasants according to Scott held deeply rooted beliefs about the right to subsistence security. Uh, they manifested a generalized aversion to risk that might threaten this security and an utter dread of those thresholds past which a household could spiral downward to the hunger and the misery. So, the inherent fear of uh, the hunger and misery and in order to overcome that and also to maintain the subsistence security, 
James Scott has uh, spoken about this work and that speaks about the strength of peasantry. Scott's thesis is that peasant social order is predicated on the fact that the worst case scenario is starvation. Peasants seek to minimize the risk of this and as such to not maximize profit which is what the West have tried to force them to do and had failed. So, virtually we can say that uh, peasantry were not been driven by the external forces or the market forces to have more and more profits rather they wanted to minimize the risk. I think uh, this is a clear cut debate which has been there and how the peasantry is going to be different from the capitalistic order because their concern was to minimize the risk rather than to maximize the profit in the changing world. And the West basically was trying to play more for maximizing profits with regard to the peasantry and about the risk they were least concerned. So, James Scott's goal is to shed light to the moral psychological aspect of rebellion and thus fill an important gap in the analysis of exploitation and rebellion for the problem of rebellion is not just a problem of calorie and income, but is a question of peasants conception of social justice of the rights and obligations of the reciprocity. So, virtually we try to see that uh, the so called material needs especially or the biological needs uh, to some extent uh, basically in terms of uh, the food intake or maybe in terms of the income generation. These things have become secondary for the peasantry and what is more concerned from them of course, is their rights and obligations and also we try to see the concern of social justice how they try to have the justice for themselves by their own. I think that is going to be an important issue when we try to speak about the concern for peasantry as per James Scott's understanding about the moral economy of the peasantry. The key element in Scott's analysis are norms of reciprocity in a society and the right to subsistence of the members of that society. Scott argues that the traditional pre-capitalistic society differ substantially from the modern capitalistic societies with respect to these two elements. That is the traditional societies in general maintain the subsistence ethics that prefer safety and reliability to the longer run profit. This safety first principle leads presence to favor those institutions that minimize the risk to subsistence. So, I think uh, the safety first uh, mechanism is going to be an important issue for the peasantry and that is basically in terms of minimizing the risk to the subsistence, although they may claim much of the surplus. So, in spite of having the surplus, their concern was basically to minimize the risk of subsistence. On the other side, the informal relations between the members of traditional societies provide the means to secure the survival of the individuals collaborative family and kinship ties as well as the tactic tenancy and citizenship rights and obligation set up the safety walls. So, the safety walls are been built by the family by the kinship ties as well as by the tenancy and the citizenship rights and that is where the safety walls are been created and that rescues the individual at the time of adversity. So, it is basically the concern of uh, James Scott to look into that how the kinship ties or the family ties are going to be important and uh, they are basically acting as the safety nets rather than speaking about uh, the concern for profit, the concern for having more and more production or maybe trying to have the more and more profits from the market. A family that is hard pressed will expect help from others who have fared better and will expect to reciprocate when the situation is reversed. So, it is basically seen as uh, the sort of adversity if it is happening. So, the other members have to cooperate, uh, they have to basically escape the other peasantry uh, to move out from that particular crisis which has happened and then uh, in the case of reciprocation if it is there. So, the other also has uh, is under obligation to do that. So, this is how we try to see that uh, the kinship ties or the family ties are going to be important to overcome the peasantry in the case of the crisis, the adversities which are happening because of the fluctuation of the price in the market 
or sometimes because of the adverse state policies which has happened. So, Scott's argues that commercialization of agriculture is an agrarian class relationship in the capitalistic society strip the individual from the uh, security walls of the traditional ones. In his in-depth analysis of the Burma and Cochin China cases, Scott demonstrates that the intrusion of capitalistic economic system into the integration with the wi wider world of economy, uh, these regions through, throughout their colonial administrator uh, ad undermine the subsistence security of the peasantry in five ways. First is introduction of market based insecurities which increase the variability of peasants income. Then the erosion of the village production uh, protection. Uh, third is the elimination of the traditional safety walls and fourth is the imposition of the fixed charges on the tenants income and finally, the stabilization of the taxes at the expense of the cultivating class. Now, I think these are the market based insecurities which are going to happen and which are going to create uh, trouble to the present world like basically the village protection is considered to be an important tool for the security, uh, psychological security, emotional security of the peasantry. Similarly, the traditional safety walls in terms of the family kinship network is going to be an important issue. Similarly, when we try to speak about uh, the uh, charging from the tenants income that is also going to be uh, putting them into problem and all such uh, cases are basically seen as coming from the market based. Uh, insecurities and uh, in order to overcome that uh, the peasantry has to apply the specific tactics to overcome these things. On the one side the elimination of the norms of reciprocity res results in the growth of permanent disparities and increase the polarization within the society. On the other side disregard to peasants right to subsistence causes to the marginalization of masses and create massive penury and hunger. I think this is where the peasantry was worried that uh, if such situation emerges, so their right to subsistence is going to put them into trouble, they will be at the uh, end of uh, marginalization and also it will lead to uh, other miseries like hunger and uh, food sovereignty. While the new system creates the small and the privileged labor force, it eliminates the main source of food for the greater number of landless Javanese. The potential for class polarization and conflict here is ominous. It is these negative changes in the peasants lives that undermine the legitimacy of the system in the eyes of peasants for a peasant whose subsistence hangs on a balance faces not on the personal but as a social failure. So, I think somewhere we try to see that uh, peasantry has to be seen in terms of creating their safeguards, uh, which should be seen more in terms of uh, the social obligations, social bondings or maybe we try to see the social connects which are going to be important. These are not based on uh, the individual uh, traits, they are not based on the personal uh, impersonal relations of the peasantry, rather it has to be seen that uh, these are the safety walls which are been created through the social networks and which the peasantry wants to retain. Now, I think before going into further details, uh, let us try to see that uh, how we can understand the moral economy. So, the term moral economy, it diverges from the traditional usages in three important ways. Firstly, the moral economy refers to the modern societies rather than to the pre-modern ones. So, I think first important thing that we have to keep in mind of course is that the moral economy is basically dealing with the modern societies. It is not a concern for the pre-modern societies or the traditional societies that normally we try to expect. So, the sort of a case study which we are trying to discuss is not uh, trying to speak about something which has happened in the past. We are basically dealing with the peasantry and their struggle which is happening in the modern society. Secondly, the moral economies are perceived as the dynamic and contested instead of static and harmonious. And we try to see that this dynamism as a consequence is the term is used in plural rather than in the singular sense. So, we are trying to speak about the moral economies. 
So it's not a single economy, it's a multiple economy which we are trying to see. We are trying to see it in terms of dynamicity and not in terms of the stat static characters. So it's not a one time one dimensional phenomenon, it's a multi dimensional phenomenon which has multiple dynamics which is involved in that. And thirdly, the primary focus is not what today is called as the economy, but it encompasses the broader societal sphere and the system. So, I think uh, this broader so societal sphere and the social system is going to play a crucial role and it is not the economy alone which is going to be helpful when we try to speak about the question of the moral economy. So, economy has to be seen in relation to the broader societal spheres and the social systems rather than trying to restrict it to the market or the state. Thus, moral economy was concerned with defining the threshold of suffering that serves as an impetus towards the revolution, in other words a radical change. In a nutshell, we may say that peasant resists the claim of outsiders basically of the landlords, of the money lenders, of the state on their resources when such claims encroach on their subsistence needs. James C. Scott frames his argument by considering the need for a reliable subsistence as the primordial goal of the peasant cultivators. In fact, the right to subsistence is defined as an inviolable moral principle in peasant society. The subsistence ethics then defines the moral economy of the peasant. So, virtually for the moral understanding of the moral economy the subsistence ethics plays a crucial role that is their notion of economic justice and their working definition of exploitation, their view of which claims on their product were tolerable and which were intolerable. So, we have to make out the distinction between those claims uh, which are considered as tolerable and those claims which are considered as intolerable and in that fashion we have to see the notion of economic justice and the concept of exploitation. It is in the following this logic that Scott arrives at the safety first principle uh, which is going to be an important issue. So, rather than market uh, oriented uh, profits the safety first principle has been talked about by James C. Scott whereby for those close to subsistence level of uh, existence the aversion of disaster is more important than the maximization of the average return. So, the concern is more towards the aversion of disasters to overcome the disaster rather than to have the maximization of uh, the average returns uh, the profit from the cultivation. For such a safety net to be in place the subsistence ethics has to be embedded within a norm of reciprocity between the lords and the serfs. The peasantry can tolerate the expropriation of their surplus value over the good years because the elites are obliged to guarantee their substance over the bad years. Now, I think uh, when we try to see this particular aspect whereby certain amount of uh, uh, bad years are been compromised with regard to the uh, substance economy which has happened, but it is not going to be practically true. As such in following a phenomenological interpretation rather than the conventional Marxist, un uh, Marxist understanding the question of what constitutes exploitation for the present becomes one of what is left rather than what is taken. So, the concern for having certain amount of uh, expropriation during the bad years is not going to be a permanent solution because somewhere it is going to create a crisis for the peasantry. So, what is needed in that sense of course, is how to overcome these situations that becomes an important issue. However, in the Southeast Asia this moral economy was been augmented by two major transformation. The first is the North Atlantic cap capitalism and the development of the modern state under the colonial ages. So, I think these are the two important uh, transformations which took place uh, one is the North Atlantic capitalism and another is the development of the modern state under the colonial ages that becomes an important issue. In a sense these transformations were introduced by the advent of the colonial state and the consequent integration of the colonies into the global economy. The capitalistic world market introduced a new class structure whereby the 
relationship between the landlords and the tenants lost its protective paternalistic content and becoming instead an impersonal contractual ones. The colonial state on the other hand wielded increasingly infrastructural power imposing the physical policies that stabilized state income at the expense of the rural subject which at the same time deprived these subjects of some of their immemorial rights such as their right to the forest products. Under such conditions, peasants were no longer shielded from the fluctuation of the global market prices nor given the respite offered by scavenging opportunities during the lean years. So, I think uh, when we try to see this particular thing that uh, under the colonial state, uh, we try to see that uh, the fiscal policies were in such a way that uh, we try to see that certain rights which have been given to them sometimes have been denied and uh, that sometimes has created problem for them in terms of their survival. This violation of the moral economy of subsistence ethics particularly under the exceptional deprivation of the depression Scott has argued formed the pretext for the fierce resistance of the Sayasan rebellion in Burma and Nagetin Soviets in Vietnam in the 1930s. It is particularly difficult to determine the factors that precipitated the radical change, but what Scott is concerned with is the creation of social dynamite rather than the denotation. Uh, rather I will correct it, it is a detonation uh, D E T O N A T I O N. In seeking to locate the genesis of radical action in the violation of moral obligations, Scott was being unconventional on at least two fronts. First is re embedding the rational considered consideration of the peasants within the parameter of normative values. Scott was transcending a narrow economic interpretation of society that plays ultimate value in the straightforward maximization of return. In fact, to emplace the subsistence ethics within the moral calculus of reciprocity was to adopt an approach that echoed the work of anthropologists such as Melinowski, Marcel Moss or Pierre Bourdieu for whom what is rational has to be mediated under the logic of cultural practices. Thus, one of the contribution of Scott conceptualization of moral economy is counterintuitive notion that there is a moral dimension to the economic action. So, one can see that uh, economic action can also have a moral dimension uh, which has been emphasized by uh, James A. Scott and what he says that the rationality of such action has to be judged within the normative cultural framework and it has not to be seen in the economic framework. On another front, in seeking to explicate the nature of exploitation in present society as its victims are likely to see it, Scott was imputing a modicum of subjectivity to the peasants. As such, we can count the moral economy among those studies that contribute to the elaboration of history from below. Not only because Scott's study highlights the peasantry, but also because the subject position of the peasant is situa situated as the starting point of analysis. Moreover, Scott further preoccupation with the world of peasant in terms of everyday form of resistance and text of defiance against the elite. This is already present in the moral economy, but given more extensive exposition in his equally celebrated later work that is the weapons of the weak in 1985 and domination on and the art of resistance in 1990 by James A. Scott opens up the non elite manifestation of subjectivity as a field of inquiry for the academic exploration. So, Scott is not without either admirer or critic. One of the earliest critique of moral economy uh, is given by Samuel Popkin who said had uh, whose work that is the rational present set out to refute the moral economy perspective by arguing that 
the normative institution of the present has been overly romanticized and that the present actor instead of being risk averse is very much capable of assuming the risk following a materialistic cost benefit calculus that runs against the moral and the cultural fabrics of the community. So, this critique assumes an antithetical stance to the moral economy by reverting to and defending the market metaphors and logic that Scott was trying to transcend and, and in fact he has been criticized in terms for romanticizing the institution of market uh, which has been pointed out by Edelman in 2005. It is not surprising that for a while both Marx moral economy and the rational presence becomes the juxtaposed as arguments that occupied the two ends of spectrum for any scholarly debate on peasantry encounters with the modernity. I think somewhere we try to see that uh, the notion of uh, moral economy has something to do with the modernity also because uh, uh, when the traditional aspect of uh, the traditional element of uh, the society are being carried forward into the stage of modernity, we try to see that how the traditions can survive within the modern framework. And I think uh, this co contribution by James C. Scott that is the moral economy plays a very crucial role because the morality is something to do with the traditionality uh, which involves the kinship ties, the family ties that involves the certain amount of belief system. Now, I think these things were quite crucial when we try to see that how these things are going to be an important uh, 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 instrument with regard to fighting against the adversities. So, we try to see that uh, somewhere uh, the issue of moral economy has something to do with the modernity, how to overcome the adversities of modernities has been spoken about through this particular work. One exemplary case was a symposium on peasant strategies in Asian societies, whereby the ideas were advocated about James Scott and Popkins and were taken to represent the moral and the rational economic approaches respectively in addressing the question of peasants adaptation to a world transformed by their incorporation into the modern states and into a global economy in the context of several different Asian societies. Now, I think uh, this discussion took to the task of universalizing the tendencies of James C. Scott's arguments. Contributors reject an approach based on the universal ideology of scarcity, uh, preferring instead to, to begin with the actual values of particular peasants as practiced within the specific context. It was a moral economy that did not sustain the right to subsistence as an inviolable moral principle for everyone. In the first instance, Scott assumption that the right to subsistence is inalienable is a reasonable one and this basic nexus between the nature and the culture sustains the argument for subsistence security mechanism as the key tenant of the moral economy. Nevertheless, moral economy and Scott's work in general continues to be influential in generating the scholarly debates, not at least because he has been able to bridge the gap between the political science and anthropology. More importantly, the ideas and concerns introduced in the moral economy have continued to find the currency in the 21st century transnational peasant movement. So, I think somewhere we try to see that uh, the contribution of James A. Scott in terms of an understanding has ultimately led him or its relevance even in the transnational world order. So, now we try to speak about uh, the modern and the postmodern world which is full of globalization, uh, which is full of uh, the modern forces of uh, transformation. And in this era also the understanding of the moral economy can play a crucial role. So, the notion such as the just price, the just behavior by the powerful and the food security and the food sovereignty reflects the desire by the present movement to invoke the moral norms that safeguard the interest of present worldwide as pointed out by Edelman in 2005. So, I think uh, these are the new words uh, which are coming up 
we are trying to pursue for inclusive development we try to speak about uh, the food virginity we are trying to speak about uh, the security of our food uh, which is an important concern so why these things are happening why now the state is coming out with the new amendments or the new laws which basically deals with these particular aspects i think uh, these things are required because somewhere we try to see that these aspects are missing uh, basically with regard to the uh, so called subaltern so what is required is that how the subalterns can play a crucial role uh, in order to make them uh, powerful what is required of course is that we have to talk about these issues of uh, the just price or the food security or the food sovereignty i think these things are going to be quite crucial moreover given the unreliability of the market in guaranteeing the subsistence the responsibility of the lords and the patrons have to be transposed onto the post colonial moral economy state so what really we are trying to speak about uh, the new world order in terms of the moral economy state it is not simply seen as a political state rather we are trying to speak about the moral economy state which is going to be an important issue the provision of adequate social insurance thus transcendent the scope of local reciprocity and is assumed as the right of citizenship with the current volatility in the world market the need for the moral governance and the message of moral economy as far as from becoming uh, really important so we try to see that uh, these aspects are going to play a very crucial role uh, in the contemporary scenario now we try to see that uh, market uh, which is uh, going to be privatized and the concern and the welfare for the subaltern or the downtrodden masses are not going to be taken care by the state under such situations uh, the issue of moral economy becomes very relevant and here we try to see that peasant's conception of justice as described by james scott for the south east asia in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries are not in their general outline very much different from the other times and places that is basically in the late 20th century of latin america the rights of subsistence to remain an important issue uh, thompson and scott was uh, trying to highlight the extent to which the markets are political constructions and outcome of social struggle thompson definition of moral economy tries to see the confrontation in the marketplace so basically the marketplaces are not to be seen as uh, something which are natural they are basically created they are been politically constructed sometimes we try to see that uh, uh, many times there is a fall down in the stock market or there is a sudden rise now i think these things happens uh, because somewhere it is an intrusion by an outsider in terms of a po political affair and we try to see that because of these political interventions we sometimes try to see there is a fluctuation in the market and that way we can say that the stability of market uh, in the contemporary scenario is going to be a very important issue and at this juncture when we are dealing with the james scott work of moral economy that becomes quite relevant because that is a ray of hope which will try to protect us from these adversities which are happening in the market Uh, because of the fluctuations in terms of uh, issues which are generated because of the political construction nonetheless james scott in the moral economy of the present states that he deliberately accord only the summary treatment to the role of market forces as a threat to the present subsistence in terms of security because unlike the more politically sal salient landlords and the state they were more or less impersonal processes without any readily identifiable human agency so we try to see that uh, uh, if the peasantries are making certain compromises with the landlords or with the states so the things may not be in their favor or it is not under the control of the peasantry because ultimately even if the mercy is been done by the state or the landlord it has to be at the cost of certain things but when we try to speak about the moral economy <coughs> concern of the peasantry will try to say that uh, the moral concern will be basically enacted in order to provide certain amount of dignity to the peasantry so the moral economy of peasants 
was a major intervention in the emerging field of present studies in the theories of collective action and in the debates about the history of the market and the human nature and the institutions. Scott's work of the present came for towards the end of the wave of foundational book in the present studies both in terms of building on such works and insistingly injecting a new cultural and the even psychological dimension that they sometimes lagged or downplayed. So, I think uh, James Scott's contribution is try, trying to provide a new dimension uh, towards the present studies which has not been dealt earlier and that is why I think uh, uh, we are trying to deal with James Scott at the end of uh, uh, the debate on theorizing peasantry uh, with an intention that uh, something which could have been placed earlier is been placed later and the reason for that of course is that it has its validity as on date and that is why I think uh, it is trying to give a new color towards the existence of the present and the present studies in the contemporary scenario. So, James Scott's view of the rural household in the moral economy of the present reflects Chenov's thinking particularly in its portrayal of peasant families as seeking the stable subsistence rather than higher risk maximum returns. So, I think uh, it is basically uh, what uh, moral economy of the present uh, is reflecting is the Chenov's idea. I think we have discussed about Chenov earlier also who was trying to specify the issue of the theory of present behavior and where we have discussed also that uh, present behavior is going to be articulated not because of the market forces rather it is with regard to the subsistence concern of the family. So, it is basically the family size, the size of the family farm is going to play an important role with regard to making the amount of uh, production. So, the production is to be decided not by the market or for the profit rather it has to be decided by the need of the family in terms of the family size. And so, I think we try to see that the moral economy of the peasantry uh, <coughs> by James Scott is closer to Chenov in terms of the theorization and it basically reflects certain amount of stable substance rather than towards the high higher risk maximum returns. So, Scott's work writes that peasant labor is characterized by the low opportunity cost that is a near absence of the alternative employment possibilities and a high marginal utility of income for those who are near to the subsistence level. Two claims of Chenov thus stand out as influence on Scott. First is that there is a subjectively unacceptable level of drudgery past individuals will cease to work. That is one option that subjectively unacceptable level of drudgery which has been there. And second is that the rural, rural poor engage in an unremitting pursuit of subsistence as opposed to accumulation. So, in spite of accumulation they are basically trying to put certain things for the unremittance that is going to be an important issue. So, the moral economy of the peasant is to move beyond the chain of restricted focus on the family units to the exclusion of the other social relations such as the village based network of solidarity and the mutual support. But to nonetheless it examines the implications of his insights into the household economics and psychology and for a larger political transformation. With this book Scott thus bridges the scholarship focused on the state and the agrarian structure on the one hand and the scholarship concerned primarily with the present family labor allocation and household budget on the other hand. The moral economy of the present like Chenov's theory of present economy makes an anti maximizing argument and it is here that Scott's intervention in the collective action debates is most apparent. Scott maintains that the village level system of reciprocity produces over a long historical time widely held moral expectations. Market forces which are sometimes in combination with the environmental forces also pose a challenge to these expectations and may when thresholds of what is culturally acceptable are crossed produce the rebellion and collective resistance. 
So, we try to see that uh, the because of the adverse market forces, the peasantry is trying to have certain amount of rebellion or the collective resistance as an art to fight against those adversities. So, in the moral economy of the peasant, Scott develops the concept of subsistence minimum and subsistence crisis as a part of an effort to understand the impact of the long duration on the daily life. And we try to see that the peasant of today are not the same peasants of the 1960s and the 70s when peasant studies began to occupy an important place in the social science in Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe and North America. Neither are they entirely the same peasants of the moral economy of the peasants by James C. Scott. So, virtually we try to see that uh, this particular contribution has many bearings. It tries to speak about uh, how the contribution of uh, Chenov has been taken into account uh, directly or indirectly by Chenov, although it was more on the economic lines, but uh, James C. Scott has tried to give a color to that by seeking it as an advantage towards the peasantry in terms of uh, the art of resistance uh, which has been talked about by uh, <coughs> James C. Scott. We also try to see that James C. Scott was similarly speaking about the moral criteria of the village redistributive norms. So, in the moral economy of the peasant, Scott has emphasized the development of capitalism. I think that is going to be an important issue. The development of capitalism has been taken into consideration. Then the commercialization of agrarian relations that is again going to be important and also the growth of centralizing state represents the historical locus of the peasant revolts in the modern era. Virtually we try to see that uh, the issues of uh, development of capitalism is something uh, which cannot be stopped. We try to see that there is always the potentiality of having the commercialization of the agrarian relations. Uh, that is also beyond the control of uh, uh, the people and also the growth of centralizing state. Uh, these are the things which are going to be uh, omnipresent and they are going to uh, increase uh, as the society moves towards the advancement. But the only thing of course is that how to overcome these challenges uh, which happens because of uh, either of these forces. Like when we try to say that development of capitalism will lead to higher level of exploitation. So, how to overcome this particular aspect becomes crucial. Similarly, when we try to see the commercialization of agrarian relations, we try to see that it will lead towards more market oriented production. It will also lead towards the use of technology with regard to the agricultural practices that is another important thing. The third thing that we have discussed is uh, the growth of centralizing state, whereby we try to see that the state has to dictate the terms and condition in terms of production, in terms of uh, accumulation, in terms of uh, uh, having certain amount of control over the production and on the uh, people. So, in order to overcome these situations which can be seen as uh, the side effects of the modern development, uh, what can be the possible alternatives. So, we try to see that uh, these sort of things have to be seen very seriously and uh, this has been highlighted by uh, James C. Scott in terms of his contribution towards the moral economy. We try to see that uh, the moral economy uh, which has been talked about by James C. Scott is basically seen as the large historical forces cutting across the integument of subsistence customs and traditional social relations to replace in with contrast to the market and the uniform laws. So, we try to see that uh, in order to overcome the market situations, the fluctuating market situations and the uniform laws uh, which are becoming more stringent and becoming away from the individuals, how to overcome these issues. And for that, I think uh, uh, these are the things uh, which Jim C. Scott has taken in, into consideration. Basically, when he was trying to uh, speak about the case of Vietnam, he was basically trying to speak about the issue that how the peasantry that is the rice producers, they try to have certain amount of uh, uh, security, the security of uh, the food and also uh, they could maintain certain amount of sovereignty uh, with regard to the food production. 
uh, that becomes an important issue. Market which could have played a crucial role in terms of having certain amount of control on them that is going to be crucial. Uh, we also try to see that the state which sometimes can be guided by many market forces because we sometimes say that uh, polity can uh, guide the market that can also happen. So, when the market is been diverted or been guided by the polity it can play very differently and uh, sometimes we always say that uh, whenever or in whatsoever form of government the elites going are going to play a crucial role, but peasantry cannot represent the elites. They are not going to uh, be in a dictating position. So, under these situations uh, how uh, these situations can be avoided or maybe if these situations are there how the peasantry has to act and I think uh, uh, the answer lies with James A. Scott's work uh, that is the moral economy of the peasantry. It basically tries to speak about that how we can have a sort of maximization of the security and minimization of the production. So, uh, in order to know about uh, the amount of production that we have to make, but it should not be at the cost of one's life and that is why uh, the moral economy of the peasantry by James A. Scott is trying to speak about the fact that uh, we have to be more concerned about our own uh, security, adverse security against the adverse conditions. We have to speak about uh, those conditions in which the peasantry can have the better say or they can have a better control over the adverse situations rather than they becoming the victims of the development. So, in order to be away from the sort of victimization of the adverse development which happens what is needed in that sense is that the peasantry has to come by themselves in terms of the development of the moral economy so that they can safeguard their interest. They can not only safeguard their interest, but they can also safeguard their culture. They can also help in maintaining certain amount of justice as we have discussed earlier also that uh, the issue of justice, the issue of food sovereignty, the issue of food security are going to be more important. And uh, what we try to see more in terms of one's entitlement, I think uh, moral economy is uh, based on the understanding of uh, one's own entitlement in terms of having the security of life, the security of livelihood and the security of uh, uh, one's own dignity. I think uh, these are the important things uh, which are being talked about by uh, James C. Scott directly and indirectly and he tries to pose upon many such issues which are going to be very important when we try to speak about the works of James C. Scott. So, we can say that uh, James C. Scott who is considered to be an important scholar and some sometimes we can say that his studies which have been uh, talked about are going to be seen more in terms of uh, uh, sort of a threshold study in terms of bringing about a new viewpoint about the peasantry. So, initially when we try to speak about in this concern for theorizing peasantry, we try to speak about the fact that peasantry at the initial stage how the debate on peasantry had started, it started off late in 1970s and that way I think uh, the major reason for that was that peasantry did not have a say in terms of the academic discourse. But on the contrary, we try to find out at the end of this uh, uh, segment that is theorizing peasantry, we try to find out that now peasantry has been seen in a better position in terms of having certain uh, amount of control over their uh, lifestyle, over their way of life and that is where the advantage of the peasantry is been reflected. So, I think uh, this particular issue of the moral economy is uh, uh, we try to see is uh, seen something as an alternative to the new form of uh, uh, what you can say uh, challenge a uh, new form of uh, avenue when we have the adversities of development. So, we try to see the moral economy as an alternative form of development from the viewpoint of the peasantry and that is going to play an important role. We also have to see that the peasantry that we are trying to speak about is going to be valuable uh, when they are in crisis basically if they are dealing with this aspect of moral economy. So, now we try to speak about the issue of uh, economic liberalization, we try to speak about the privatization, we try to speak about the globalization. 
Now, these are the new threats uh, which are basically seen as uh, uh, coming uh, because of the so called uh, uh, new form of development. So, in these stances where we have these new forms of development, the basic idea is that uh, under these situations of liberal uh, what we call it as LPG liberalization, privatization and globalization, we try to see that uh, how we can sustain ourselves in various spheres and uh, here James Scott's work is going to be quite crucial because it is not only highlighting the important concern for uh, the sort of security, but it is also providing an answer in terms of having certain amount of dignity uh, towards the peasantry. So, the end of uh, the theorizing of peasantry uh, has been reflected by the James Scott's contribution and we try to see that how it is going to be an important issue with regard to the new understanding about the peasantry in the modern world. So, ultimately we can say that uh, the moral economy argument maintains that the peasants are moved to protest when the capitalistic penetration of the countryside leads to the loss of subsistence as a result of breakdown in the pattern client relationship linking them to the elites. So, virtually we try to see that uh, we are trying to end up with the so called Jajmani relations, we are trying to see the ending of uh, uh, the sort of relationship which has been there in the countryside. So, under these adverse situations if these things are happening, what are the new ways in which the peasantry can come out come forward for their own survival and in order to cope up with the new market forces uh, what is required is that they have to see uh, their production, they have to see their lifestyle more in terms of moral economy. I think uh, this is where uh, we have to see uh, this particular work and uh, I think uh, uh, we have plenty of uh, uh, material which basically deals with the, the issue of uh, moral economy new debates have been raised on this issue that we have discussed also in this particular thing and uh, people have to actually read uh, this particular work and apart from the moral economy of the peasantry another significant and celebrated work of James Scott which I highlighted earlier also is uh, the weapons of the weak uh, that is everyday forms of peasant resistance is another important work that came in 1985 that is by James Scott. Uh, one has to also see uh, James Scott's contribution in 1990s as the domination and the art of resistance uh, that is going to be another important issue uh, which one has to highlight. And apart from that uh, E. P. Thompson has also written significantly on the moral economy and uh, his contribution came in 1966 that is the making of an English working class. I think that is another important contribution uh, which one has to really view and also uh, E. P. Thompson has worked on the moral economy of the English crowd in the 18th century. I think these are the two works uh, one which came in 1966 and another is 1971 they are going to be quite crucial when we try to speak about the moral economy and uh, as a new debate I think uh, we try to see the contribution of uh, Mark Eldman uh, that came in the uh, newer phase that is the uh, bringing the moral economy back into the study of 21st century. Uh, the transnational present movement. I think this is uh, again going to be a very important work which tries to give more impetus to the James Scott contribution and also we have the Mark Alderman's work in 1998 that is on transnational present politics in the Central America. I think these are the works uh, which one has to really refer and uh, through these works we can know that how peasantry can play a crucial role with regard to the understanding of the modern forces of change and that can be seen as a transnational movement uh, which the peasant can take up in terms of fighting against uh, the odd situations which are emerging because of globalization or which are happening because of the modern forces of change. So, the need of the hour of course is uh, as we have structured this uh, uh, particular uh, <coughs> unit uh, that is on theorizing peasantry, I think we try to have multiple debates trying to see how the debate of peasantry had started. Then we move down to another important aspect that is what we try to see in terms of uh, the economic of uh, the peasantry. We have also tried to see peasantry in terms of processes. We also try to see the agendas uh, which has happened because of uh, the 
agriculture uh, capitalistic development and how the peasantry has reacted to that. We have also spoken about that particular issue and ultimately now we are talking about the moral economy which is basically seen as an answer for the survival of the peasantry in the modern era. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, uh, which we have to keep in mind. Uh, the unit has been structured in such a fashion which will make you competent with regard to the understanding of the peasantry from its evolution and till the contemporary scenario and this will make you equipped better with how we can deal with the peasantry in the contemporary scenario. So, friends I think uh, these are the important things which I wanted to share with regard to uh, this whole theme and also with regard to the present topic of discussion that is the moral economy of the peasantry. So, with these words I will say thanks for uh, patience listening and we will try to have further clarification when we try to have some discussions in the later phase. Thank you to all of you.